Right. Well, welcome, everybody. Good evening. Uh, you're well, very, very welcome. A big welcome on behalf of the British Commission for Maritime uh, History to this, uh, the final King's Maritime History Seminar of 2021, organized, uh, as you know, by the British Commission for Maritime History, but with the support of the Society for Nautical Research uh, and uh, Lloyd's uh, Register and hosted uh, by the Lawton Naval Unit uh, here in the Department of War Studies and as part of the Sir Michael Howard Center for the History of War, all uh, at King's College uh, London. Uh, thank you all for joining and such numbers again um, online. Uh, with any luck, um, with this new variant, we will be able to proceed as planned uh, in the new year by meeting uh, in a room and with a glass of wine that I can share rather than just have to uh, <laughs> to myself. Uh, but I'm hoping also that when we do that, we'll be able to take advantage, continue to take advantage um, of the uh, online uh, format. And one of the uh, benefits of that is, of course, uh, that we can have people from overseas join us. And I'm really pleased to say that tonight uh, we have uh, Alan Anderson uh, with us. You might recognize him. He's spoken to us, uh, to this group before. Um, seems to me, if memory serves correctly, somebody had stolen one of the cables that connected the computer to the projector or something like that. And we couldn't see your slides. If, But uh, we won't have that problem tonight because we uh, met earlier, we've practiced, everything's ready to go. And Alan is a uh, former PhD student and graduate um, of the Department of War, War Studies here at uh, King's. He works on the, the laws uh, of naval warfare and strategy in Britain and the US from uh, 1899 to 1909. Um, he makes most of his filthy lucre. Uh, he pays for his uh, private library, I think, um, as an attorney, uh, but we can forgive uh, that because he uh, also teaches uh, military uh, history uh, at Norwich University uh, in the United States. And today, um, he's going to focus on uh, 1909, the conference in London, uh, the effect of that and the difficulties, I think, uh, that it uh, encountered. So it's with uh, great thanks that I uh, hand over to you, Alan. Well, thank you, Alan. Um, unlike you who have a glass of wine, I just have a bottle of water, which is kind of there and gone from my background. But and uh, as I told Alan, unfortunately, my background is not my library. It's the library I wish I had. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I am going to uh, hopefully, if this works uh, well, uh, share my screen and uh, give you my talk with the benefit of some slides, uh, PowerPoint slides um, uh, today. Uh, if you have any questions along the way, if you don't want to wait until the end, uh, please feel free to raise your hand using the little function at the bottom of your screen and we'll try to uh, answer them. Uh, otherwise, hopefully, if I do the timing correctly, there will be time uh, at the end for some question and answers. Um, so without further ado, let me see if I can do this and share the screen. And there, is that working? Alan? Yes, it is. All right, excellent. So uh, I am going to be uh, talking about uh, the London Naval Conference of 1909 and the last chance of regulating naval warfare. Uh, the 1909 London Naval Conference was the last of the three uh, major international conferences uh, pre-First World War. Uh, the first being the 1899 Hague Conference, followed by the 1907 Hague Conference, and then the London Naval Conference of 1909. All of them uh, in one form or another addressed questions relating to the law of naval warfare. Uh, and this was the very last one. So <clears throat> I'm gonna start uh, sort of near the end actually. And let's see if I can go, there we go. So uh, June 24th, 1914, Imperial Germany, uh, told England that it had accepted in essentials the new proposals of the British government relating to two um, phrases that had been uh, in issue between the two governments 
since the 1909 conference uh, declaration had been signed. Um, but after a lot of back and forth and give and take, uh, Imperial Germany said, well, we've accepted it. So uh, Arthur, Arthur Zimmerman, the acting secretary of state for foreign affairs asked England to confirm that it would now ratify the declaration. This was a significant diplomatic achievement uh, for Britain. It had been trying for more than five years to obtain ratification of the declaration. Uh, all of the other signatories to the declaration had agreed to the terms except for these two phrases that were in dispute between Britain and Imperial Germany. England had uh, asked and wanted the pronouncement on the agreed principles of international naval law, and it seemed like they had achieved it. So the question is, how did they get to this uh, apparent diplomatic breakthrough? Why did it take so long? And what happened after that? And that's uh, what I hope to explore uh, very briefly uh, today. Um, and I will tell you that on a lot of the topics, you know, we could do a deep dive uh, as we go along here because there's a lot of backstories and, and things like that that uh, uh, were involved. So this is, a, a, to a great extent, a somewhat superficial review. Uh, but if anyone asks questions like that, you know, I'm certain that I would be, that we could go on for uh, hours and hours and hours, and Alan would have to consume the entire bottle of wine that he has um, in order to get to the end. But, you know, that way he, but that may not be the best thing for, uh, for Alan at least. So where did the, uh, going to start with, how the 1909 London Naval Conference came about. And it arose because Britain was unable to conclude an agreement at the 1907 Hague Conference on subjects of blockade and contraband. Those were um, critical issues for Britain and uh, the Admiralty at the 1907 Hague Conference. Um, Britain wanted an agreement identifying specific items as either absolute contraband, those are items that clearly have military uses that are subject to be seized, uh, whether uh, at sea, they're being in ship, being shipped, or conditional contraband. Uh, those are items that may or may not be of military value. Uh, and it was a real issue because uh, at the, in the 1904-1905 Russo-Japanese War, uh, Russia had declared uh, as contraband items that for many, many years uh, had been thought to be not absolute contraband, uh, raw materials such as cotton, which of course uh, was a big thing for uh, British industry. And so England wanted to have an agreement on specific items of absolute contraband. And it also had questions regarding the scope of a blockade, how you know, far out from uh, a port could a blockade be conducted and be considered effective? Um, that was a major issue. And then lastly, there was the doctrine of continuous voyage, which uh, first came out of the uh, 18th century. The doctrine basically that if you're a, a ship and you're, but you're carrying port products to a neutral port, but then going to go from the neutral port as your first port of call to a, an enemy port, your products, you're still subject to seizure because the, they're gonna look at what's the continuous voyage. Now, during the American Civil War, that doctrine had been expanded uh, in, in US courts to include that even if you unloaded the products at a neutral port, but then they were going to be transshipped by land uh, to the enemy, they would still be subject to seizure. So they wanted to have uh, a, a clear definition of the concept of continuous voyage. For Britain, as I said, indicate here, they wanted to abolish conditional contraband, uh, but at least get the agreed list of what was or was not contraband, because that was important to Britain's trade uh, if they were a neutral. And I should point out that Britain at this time thought that if there was any future European conflict, chances are they were gonna be a neutral as opposed to a belligerent. Now, just for Historical background, this is the group picture uh, at the 1899 Hague Conference. And having looked at this extensively, there's Jackie Fisher uh, in the back. Uh, I'm quite confident of that. Um, he's, uh, he was the uh, British uh, uh, technical, Royal Na technical Naval Delegate. 
Uh, interestingly, despite looking at this uh, over and over again, I have not been able to identify Alfred Thayer uh, Mahan, who is a uh, his corresponding technical uh, uh, counterpart, naval counterpart for the United States delegation, the US delegation. I don't know if you can see my pointer here, but there are the, the other four members are right here in the front row, uh, but not uh, Mahad. Here is the group picture for the 1907 Hague Conference. I put these up in part because uh, for the 1909 London Naval Conference, I have not been able to find any group portrait uh, or photograph that was taken during the conference, um, which kind of tells you, you know, how, uh, you know, little it was considered to be significant at the time, although I think it was much more significant. So anyway, during the 1907 Hague Conference in September of 1907, and keep in mind that the Hague Conference had been ongoing since June, so it had been going on a long time, much longer than it was anticipated. Uh, Admiral Otley, who was the uh, British naval uh, delegate, told the foreign office that, look, we can probably work out a deal with Imperial Germany, but it's going to be too late to get all the necessary approvals of everyone attending. And so he wanted uh, approval to tell delegates from the principal naval powers that blockade and a couple of other topics, all relating just to naval issues, would be discussed at a small conference in London in the spring of 1908. Uh, the reaction at the Foreign Office, and this is a picture of uh, Edward Gray, was, you know, we're sick and tired of all these conferences, and so we'd really like to work this out now. But by the same time, you know, they recognized that this was an important issue because this was important, you know, how blockade would be uh, described or defined uh, or limited, uh, was it would otherwise be left for determination by the uh, International Prize Court. Uh, a convention uh, on which had been agreed previously at the 1907 Hague Conference. So this was an important issue. And even though they were tired of conferences, you know, Gray was like, okay, we can, uh, you know, continue on later. At the conference in 1907, Germany had tied agreement on blockade and contraband to abolition of the doctrine of continuous voyage. It wanted it completely abolished. And of course, the reason for that is they realized that in any future continental war where they were going to be able to continue to get tra have trade is through neutral ports in the Netherlands or Belgium. It also wanted to limit the area uh, in which a, a merchant ship trying to avoid a blockade could be seized. Uh, and to you know, say that basically, if it's carrying contraband but heading for a neutral port next to a blockaded port, can't stop it. So they wanted, they, that's what they wanted at the conference. Obviously, very significant positions for Imperial Germany that would favor it uh, in any future war. Not surprisingly, the Admiralty, oh, by the way, back here at this slide, that is uh, Wilhelm II uh, in the uniform of a uh, Royal Navy Admiral of the Fleet. Uh, the uh, monarchies in Europe at the time were very fond of giving each other uh, honorary ranks and positions in their militaries. And Wilhelm II uh, very much enjoyed dressing up in uh, uniforms. You can see him wearing the uh, uh, riband of the Order of the Garter there. Anyway, the Admiralty wanted to be able to seize a neutral ship carrying contraband anywhere within an area of 800 miles of a blockaded port. That was, and they viewed that as a real concession because in, in the Admiralty's view, International law at the time enabled them to capture a vessel, even at Yokohama, that's in Japan, if the vessel was proceeding to a European blockaded port. So it didn't matter how far away they were. They could seize a vessel halfway or almost the entire way around the world. Uh, and this is Reginald McKenna, who was the first Lord of the Admiralty at the time. Uh, however, Gray decided to defer further attempts to reach an agreement um, because he wanted an understanding on those subjects that would be clear because under Article 7 of the International Prize Court Convention, uh, if there wasn't an applicable treaty, then the prize court would apply rules of international law. And if there was no generally recognized rule in existence, it'd give judgment according to general principles of justice and equity. And 
Britain did not want to leave this very important subject open for interpretation by some international prize court. They wanted a generally recognized rule uh, so that they knew what the ground rules would be uh, in any future war. So having deferred discussion and agreement uh, on these naval issues at the 1907 uh, Hague Conference, which finally uh, adjourned in October of 1907. In February of 1908, Britain invited nine major sea powers to a conference in London. And the nine powers were Austria, Hungary, France, Germany, Great Britain, of course, Italy, Japan, Russia, Spain, and the United States. Now, later on, uh, the Netherlands uh, wriggled their way in uh, because they asked, hey, we should be invited. We've always been considered, we already consider ourselves a major sea power. The US said, sure, invite them. So Britain said, okay, fine. So there were 10 countries then that attended the conference. Prior to the conference, Britain asked all of them to send us a memorandum on what the correct rule of international law was in eight maritime warfare topics. So it was more than just the two or three plus blockade that Otley had first uh, raised back in September of 1907. Those that eight topics were rules relating to contraband, blockade, the doctrine of continuous voyage, uh, the destruction of neutral vessels prior to condemnation by a prize court, uh, rules relating to neutral ships or persons rendering unneutral service, the legality of converting uh, merchant ships to warships, the transfer of merchant ships from a belligerent uh, state to a neutral flag during or anticipation of hostilities, and whether the nationality or domicile of the owner of a vessel should be the determinant, the dominant factor in deciding whether property was enemy property subject to seizure. Uh, Germany responded, uh, but said, hey, we think we ought to work toward a treaty, an agreed treaty. And Germany asked the United States to agree to this approach. Now, I think they asked, they assumed that the US would agree because the US uh, had worked very closely and had cooperated with Germany on a number of issues at the 1907 Hague Conference, such that Great Britain viewed uh, the US as increasingly uh, allied with Imperial Germany. Uh, however, uh, somewhat surprisingly, at least for Imperial Germany, the US said, eh, we're not gonna even respond on this to your request for our positions. See our Naval War Court of 1903, which had not been enforced since 1905, but that's all we're gonna do. Every other country except for Spain uh, sent in a memorandum of their positions ultimately. Russia also preferred creating treaties to establish laws, but Great Britain insisted that what it wanted was a statement of here's what the recognized naval law is that everyone is in agreement with, even if we've got to make some uh, modifications uh, to those rules. So that was the, you know, the, the ground, if you will, the foundation for uh, calling the conference to start. So December 4, 1908, the conference is opened in London uh, with what was described as a rather colorless speech by uh, uh, Gray. A week later, it adjourns. Uh, for the holiday period until uh, 11 January. And then it starts up again and it finishes finally on February 26th. Uh, Rear Admiral Edmund Slade, he is one of England's uh, delegates. Uh, he thinks that the US is gonna support uh, England's views. Uh, but he thought that Germany was going to take a very uncompromising attitude and would give Great Britain a great deal of trouble. He was wrong. He was wrong. And this, by the way, is Slade uh, here in the corner. Has a very interesting mustache. I don't know if you can see, but he's waxed the ends out to points. Um, very, a uh, little bit different than your normal handlebar mustache. They're not curled, they're just straight out. Anyway. The U.S. delegation, which is Rear Admiral Charles Stockton and George Wilson, an international law professor, 
uh, go into the uh, conference with no specific instructions on most issues. And so as a result, uh, the US turns out to be the biggest impediment throughout the 1909 Naval Conference. They have to ask for uh, directions uh, back from the United States uh, at every, uh, every time something comes up. And sometimes that results in a change in position where they would have said in the conference, well, we believe that this is our position. And so this is what we think. And then, you know, a couple of days later, they have to say, oops, sorry, uh, we have a different position. Uh, the U.S. is very adamant that it's not going to give up the doctrine of continuous voyage. Not going to give it up at all. This is also, as we talked about, as I mentioned, an important issue for Britain. But for the US, they are just absolute, forget it. We're not gonna um, give up the doctrine of continuous voyage in any, any way, shape or form. Interestingly, Germany is willing to agree to England's proposed lists of absolute and contraband, uh, absolute and conditional contraband, but it wants England to give up continuous voyage. Now that obviously would be a significant concession for England, indeed Slade, recognizes that that's going to, if we're belligerent in a future uh, war, it's going to prevent us from stopping German trade by sea because it's going to continue through neutral Belgian and Dutch ports. Uh, but he concludes that, you know, the doctrine really isn't that worth, isn't worth it that much to us because it really isn't going to impact the enemy that much. Uh, and second, in the South African war, uh, Britain's experiences militated against it. Now, during the South African War, Britain had taken a very uh, aggressive stand or position on the doctrine of continuous voyage. Uh, and a lot of uh, neutral ships were heading toward uh, neutral ports uh, uh, around the edges of uh, the Boer Republics. And they seized uh, both American and German uh, vessels under the doctrine of continuous voyage. And that resulted in a uh, really significant diplomatic row uh, between Britain and the United States and between Britain and Germany. Uh, between Britain and the United States, uh, it got to the point where the US was basically saying, look, you either stop this or else. Uh, Germany was sending all sorts of very strongly worded diplomatic messages. Ultimately, Britain had to back off and stop uh, their aggressive use of the doctrine of continuous voyage. So given that experience, he militated against it. And by the same token in the Russo-Japanese war, among other things, there had been a lot of consternation when Russia uh, declared various products that had long thought to be not subject to seizure as contraband, conditional contraband. Uh, they declared a lot of products uh, which the British economy depended on as contraband subject to seizure. Uh, and so Slade recognizes this and determines, you know, this isn't uh, uh, that significant of a benefit to us. Uh, and so Britain and Germany uh, reach an understanding on what's contraband in terms of absolute and conditional. And they agree to eliminate the doctrine of continuous Con continuous voyage it should be, uh, except for absolute contraband. And that's, you know, seems a reasonable splitting of the baby, if you will. It was conditional contraband, there's no uh, doctrine of continuous voyage, but if it's absolute contraband, it's subject to seizure, even if it's only ultimately going to get to into the hands of the enemy. So it seems like they've got a deal. Everything's going to go through swimmingly except for the US. The US refuses to agree. And they refuse to agree even if it risks breaking up the entire conference. And they're warned, look, this is gonna ruin the US reputation uh, if it maintains its position. Uh, and the uh, American delegate, Admiral Stockton, who pleads with the Secretary of State to look, accept this compromise because Continuous voyage isn't that big of a deal for blockade. Uh, conditional contraband is secondary and occasional. You know, the German-British compromise is conditional contra contraband 
is not subject to the doctrine of continuous voyage. And he points out that, hey, this is going to be a real value to the U.S. Uh, in terms of its trade as a neutral in any future war, because that's where we're going to be as a neutral trading. And we want to be able to have our ships uh, sending out and trading uh, at neutral ports. Uh, and, and so that's going to be important to us. Finally, after much, you know, you know, sort of discussion, uh, the U.S. finally concedes, says, OK, fine, we'll agree to this. When Stockton makes the announcement, there's great applause. Everyone thinks, OK, finally, we're going to get this uh, declaration done, but it doesn't happen. The U.S. continues to nitpick on wording on various parts of the uh, declaration. Slade writes in his diary, the Americans are impossible and there is a strong probability of their wrecking everything. So there is no love lost between the US and Britain as the uh, conference seems to be grinding to uh, a uh, dissolution with nothing, no agreement being reached. Uh, and there's various issues that are being nitpicked by the US. Finally, Gray meets with the US ambassador to uh, the court of St. James in uh, mid-February 1909 and basically says, look, uh, make a deal here. You know, we can work through any other issues just between us, but let's get this deal done. And so finally they signed the declaration concerning the laws of maritime war on February 26th. This is a, not a treaty. It is not a, here's what we think the uh, laws of naval warfare are or should be or excuse me, what they, should, what they should be. This is what everyone here, these 10 sea, major sea powers have agreed uh, that the rule, the laws of maritime warfare are. It's a big deal. Internally in England, the Admiralty views the results favorably. And I should say that there has been a lot of research and a lot of things written suggesting that the Foreign Office in Gray hoodwinked the Admiralty that the Admiralty uh, really wasn't in favor of the, the declaration uh, and all sorts of things, that there was all sorts of uh, skullduggery and that uh, uh, the Foreign Office, uh, you know, sabotaged the Admiralty's position. Uh, on my research, I think that is simply incorrect. Uh, I think the Admiralty uh, went in to the conference, uh, eyes wide open, they understood uh, what the issues were. They did a careful analysis of what the benefits uh, were to uh, various positions. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, they realized that they had to balance much more than had been in previously in the case. They had to balance the role of Britain as a belligerent in warfare versus Britain as a neutral in warfare. And so unlike even 10 years earlier at the 1899 Hague Conference, where the Admiralty's views were very much on the, what I'll call pro-belligerent side of the, uh, of the stadium. Uh, by 1909, after the South African War and the Russo-Japanese War, they realized that, look, we have to balance our, our views with what we would want if we we're neutral. Because again, as I mentioned, they viewed it the most likely that, that Britain's position in the uh, next continental war would be as a neutral. So the Admiralty is favor views the results favorably. The Director of Naval Intelligence views it as favorably. The Admiralty Secretary is very effusive. And he wrote that we gain as a neutral and as a belligerent, while we lose something, you know, we actually gain because we've got a clear definition of what, the, uh, what our powers are under international law. And what we'll be able to do is against neutral trade with an enemy uh, without having difficulties arise, uh, which happened in South Africa. That, that, those experiences are really out, you know, hanging there and they're quite, quite a role in what they're de determining. So the Admiralty is very uh, happy about this. The foreign secretary is very positive about it. He congratulates the delegation on what has been achieved. And you know, on the critical issues, there was an agreed itemization of what absolute and conditional contraband is, you know, byproduct and 
in conditional contraband and in, in contraband that was not subject to seizure, uh, Britain had gotten basically everything it wanted in terms of raw materials not being subject to seizure, um, food not being subject to seizure. And that was, a, that was important to Britain because of course most of the food is imported and they also have to keep on getting in the raw materials for British industry. Continuous voyage, yes, that is uh, you know, no longer uh, or is abrogated, but it's still applicable to absolute contraband. So the worst, if you will, materials, products that are clearly of military value, still subject to seizure under continuous voyage doctrine. And for a blockade, the scope of an effective blockade is a very vague into, you know, I'm, I'm not good at French, so I'm, sure I'm certain I'm going to mispronounce this, the rayon d'action is basically the scope of an effective blockade, which is, it's just basically the reason, the area of action. It's an elastic, it varies according to circumstances. So unlike initially when the Admiralty thought, hey, if we agree to 800 miles as a limit, that's a big uh, concession. They get a vague phrase, which is going to vary. And so it could be in some instances, you know, a couple hundred miles, or it could be thousand miles. It's, you know, however the, uh, the blockade ships or the blockade line is running. And it means that you don't really have to have that many ships. If you've got a, a naval vessel cruising back and forth, you know, 900 miles outside of a, a potential port, that's going to be enough to, to, if you run into a neutral vessel, to be able to seize it and see what's going on. So, you know, on paper, this seems to be a really good result for uh, England. Other nations agree. The General Board of the Navy approves the, the declaration. Uh, the U.S. Congress approve, ratifies the International Prize Court Convention. They approve the Declaration of London. But President Taft doesn't sign it because everybody's waiting to make sure he, that all of the other nations ratify it as well. So it's kind of in limbo, uh, at least in the United States, as of 1912. In Britain, however, uh, there's a lot of criticism. And this is my pitch for uh, the Corbett 100 project uh, that the department is doing. Uh, a lot of critics claim that the uh, uh, declaration unduly restricts England's rights as a belligerent, unreasonably limits neutral rights and expands belligerent rights to the detriment of Britain's ability to maintain its food supply during war. Now, Corbett, pre uh, the start of the 1907 Hague Conference, had written uh, an article uh, that was published in a edited volume that uh, Mahan edited, uh, basically uh, arguing against um, uh, any rules that would limit Britain's uh, maritime uh, warfare uh, rights. Uh, the big, uh, uh, the primary criticism comes from uh, Maurice Hankey, uh, who writes uh, a number of uh, papers suggesting that the 1909 declaration is bad. That results in uh, the uh, counter arguments by uh, members of the British delegation who reviewed it. Uh, Lord uh, Dessart uh, says, no, this isn't true. So there's a lot of back and forth. My own analysis is that Hankey was just trying to gain political points uh, in the debate. Ultimately, however, uh, ratification in Britain falls victim to the Conservative House of Lords. Uh, they veto ratification, and it occurred after passage of the Parliament Act of 1911, which removed their ability to veto money bills. But despite that, uh, despite that occurring, uh, England keeps trying to gain acceptance. And the focus shifts to let's get agreement from Germany, because everybody else is basically fine with it. And they're not going to, you know, you know, object if we get a, the kind of, a, if we work out a deal with Germany on the two remaining areas of issue. And that's the meaning of the scope and interpretation of the phrases, and I'm not going to try it in French, but it's a fortified place in base in Article 34 of the Declaration. That article presumes that conditional contraband is destined for use by the enemy which would make it subject to seizure if it's consigned to a fortified place belonging to the enemy or other place serving as a base for the armed forces of the enemy. 
And that is an issue for Great Britain because so many of its naval bases are right next to uh, ports, trading ports, where there's a lot of neutral trade. And so they're concerned that unless they've got a clear understanding with Germany of what those two phrases mean, Germany could, under the declaration, start seizing vessels that are, you know, heading for uh, a, the neutral side of the port as opposed to the uh, naval base side. And that's what goes back and forth. And I will tell you that over the uh, years between uh, 1911 and 1912, and then the late June of 1914, there is a lot of back and forth. Britain proposes a interpretation, Germany comes back, Germany proposes an interpretation, Britain says no and comes back. It is back and forth, back and forth over the years until finally in, on June 27th, they reach a deal. They reach an agreement and it is the agreement that Britain had or the interpretation that Britain has proposed. So Britain seems happy. Uh, Germany is now satisfied. It's like, great, this is now finally Britain is going to get or obtain what it set out to achieve uh, in uh, the 1909 London Naval Conference, a clear agreed statement by the major sea powers of here's the laws of uh, naval warfare as they exist, not something that we need to have treaties about, but this is, you know, basically generally accepted international law. Uh, that will govern naval warfare. Uh, however, for those of you who were perceptive to uh, pick up that the agreement was reached on June 27th of 1914, it was very quickly uh, overcome by events the very next day, June 28th, when Franz Ferdinand, uh, the heir to the Austro-Hungarian throne is assassinated in Sarajevo. Uh, by the way, uh, a pitch uh, for the uh, Austrian Military Museum in Vienna, the photograph of the actual car he was riding in, which miraculously survived uh, both the First and Second World War, is on display in the Austrian Military Museum uh, in Vienna. Uh, it is rarely visited. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to be there several times, uh, and there's generally nobody around. And if you pretend you don't speak English very or speak uh, German, you can take a lot of pictures. Um, this is a photograph of the actual car. There's actually uh, two bullet holes where bullets entered, as you can see. Uh, if you can see, one is there, and the other one is right there in the door. But Franz Ferdinand is assassinated along with his wife. Initially, no one thinks it's going to be a big deal. In fact, the first story about it in the uh, Times of London is uh, buried in the paper. Uh, to the extent there are news stories about it, everyone's basically saying, gee, this is really too bad for the Archduke and his uh, kids. Uh, they're now all orphans, but nobody thinks it's going to be a big deal. However, yeah, there start, things start to move. Uh, there are miscalculations and foolish decisions made. Uh, pretty much everywhere in the uh, capitals of Europe. By July 30th, the Foreign Office realizes that, hey, this is getting to be really serious here. And so it tells the Admiralty, look, we need to get this thing um, enacted. It was going to be done through the Naval Prize Procedure Bill. Uh, we got to do this right away or else we're going to miss this opportunity. But unfortunately, uh, it doesn't happen. The looming world war dooms further action on implementation of the Declaration of London. However, that's not the end of the story for the Declaration. Because three days after uh, Great Britain uh, declares war on Germany, the United States sends a uh, diplomatic note to the uh, main belligerents, Austria-Hungary, Belgium, France, Germany, Great Britain, and Russia, and says, hey, are you going to adhere to the rules of the Declaration of London during the war? We want to know. Because the U.S. now wants some certainty as to what the rules of the game are going to be. France immediately says, much, some, much really to England's surprise, sure. Austria, Hungary, and Germany say, we'll adhere to it if everybody else adheres to it. Um, so it seems like 
yeah, it's still going to, the Declaration of London is still going to have some vitality uh, despite the existence of the war. Britain, however, and this is what's, you know, interesting is even though they had been working so hard for this declaration and for its, you know, implementation, they're like, ah, geez, I don't know. And they, they first put off the U.S. and basically say, we're thinking about it. There's a lot of debate about how they're going to, what they're going to do. And finally, on August 19, they have a conference. It includes <clears throat> Gray, foreign minister, um, head of the, the Home Secretary, uh, Winston Churchill as First Lord of the Admiralty, others from those departments, and they discuss what they're going to do in terms of adhering or not adhering to the Declaration of London, and they decide that, well, we'll adhere to it, except we're going to make some changes on the issues of conditional contraband, basically forget what we agreed that, can, that the doctrine of continuous voyage is gone for conditional contraband, and we're going to throw into scope of conditional contraband products that we previously had wanted to be not contraband and not subject to seizure. And we're going to modify uh, what a blockade is in terms of being enforceable. And so there is an announcement uh, of the uh, Crown in Council. And then Britain formally tells the US, well, we're going to, they try to put a good spin on it. We're going to generally adopt the rules of the Declaration of London subject to certain modifications and additions, which we think are indispensable to the efficient conduct of our naval operations. Uh, to say that the US uh, didn't appreciate the response is an understatement. Uh, there is a uh, diplomatic note uh, in the US archives, which is uh, very strongly worded, even for diplomatic language, uh, objecting. Germany objects, not surprisingly, because, you know, they thought that they were in, in good shape under the declaration. So they object, but England says, nope, nope, we're gonna have these modifications. What occurs over the next two years or nearly two years of the First World War is that when Germany starts to violate the laws of warfare on land, Britain retaliates by saying, okay, we're gonna change the rules of naval warfare, basically cutting back further on the Declaration of London. And it is a tit for tat back and forth uh, over the next two years until finally in July of 1916, England says, that's it. We're not going to follow any of the provisions of the Declaration of London at all. It's done. Uh, and that was the end of, uh, of it in terms of, you know, its vitality uh, in the uh, First World War. So what can we conclude from this very brief overview? I think first that the Declaration of London was a hard fought consensus on the laws of naval warfare as they existed at that time. They provides a real picture of what uh, the major sea powers at least thought the laws of maritime warfare uh, were in 1909. And they were unanimously approved. Britain presses forward for ratification despite internal political concerns because or, uh, in the country, because there is really uh, everyone, foreign office, admiralty, the government says this is going to be favorable for us in the long run. But ratification is overtaken by the assassination of Franz Ferdinand as Europe blunders into war. So on the eve of the First World War, the U.S. position on the declaration is much like its current position on the U.N. Convention on the Law of the Sea. It's not ratified, but most of it is accepted as customary international law. Arguably, the U.S. position is, hey, this is customary international law that's been accepted because everyone's agreed to it. Uh, and they, that's why they ask for everyone to say, to confirm that they're going to comply with its terms. Uh, but it doesn't happen. So once war starts, the Declaration statements of generally accepted principles of naval warfare fail due to the uh, inherent uncertainties and vicissitudes of war. No belligerent is willing to even appear to tie at all its Navy's hands in the conduct of naval warfare. Uh, certainly Britain uh, backs away because they're concerned about what's going to happen uh, in the war. So in this respect, I would say that the declaration is an underappreciated predictor of the eventual failure of the far more ambitious international naval conferences in London and in Washington in the interwar years, which attempted even more, more uh, 
significant issues of disarmament. And the conclusion then is that it's easy to accept, relatively easy to accept limitations in the conduct of war in the abstract, but it's much more difficult when armed conflict looms on the horizon or is actually uh, arisen. Thank you. And wow, I think my timing is pretty well perfect. Uh, I'm <laughs> pleased with that. So I'm now going to stop screen sharing. Excellent. I think, I think, you, I think your timing was impeccable. Yeah. And Excellent. I've got a question I see. Yes. Yeah, so and that's from Ian Stafford. So what I'm going to do is give him permission to talk. Uh, Ian, you might want to ask your question. You can even turn your camera on if you if you like. Should be on. Oh, oh there we are. You're coming. Let me see um, your Go ahead. We see your name, not your face, but uh, but we can hear you. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, I would assume my camera would have come on automatically. Um, uh, I, I don't want to be too 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 picky, but I, I am intrigued as to um, what what the House Lords was voting on, because uh, uh, although uh, you've used the term ratification, uh, what happens in the Houses of Parliament is not ratification. Um, and um, to my knowledge, the Ponsonby rule, which say, says the, the, the government does not normally um, uh, proceed to ratification if the document laid before the House is voted down um, um, within so many days. But that doc the doctrine came in in the 1920s. So um, I, I, I'm rather um, uh, slightly uh, miffed whether it was just a resolution that the yeah. government decided not to proceed on, um, in which case the Parliament Acts would have been no relevance one way or the other. Um, you, are, you, you are quite right, and if my memory serves correctly, what they were actually voting on was the Naval Prize Bill. Ah, right. <laughs> that embodied the, uh, uh, the principles of the Declaration of London. And that's ah, yeah. why later on, after there was agreement, there was the rush to try to get the Naval Prize Bill uh, enacted um, that I mentioned in, in 1914. Uh, but it was the, I mean, interestingly, the Naval Prize Bill was, that was what was being debated. Uh, the Admiralty had gone ahead and had uh, created a new uh, manual uh, for uh, Naval Prizes uh, for the Royal Navy. And then when the Prize Bill came up, it was the House of Lords that uh, beat it, and that was the pro that was the issue that seemed to kill it at the time. But the government pressed on. I, I, so and I hope that answers your question. Yeah, and the other one was um, wh whether the uh, treaty was meant to be only come into effect if everybody ratified. No, uh, but very quickly, it was clear that you know no one was going to. Uh, ratify it or put it into effect unless everybody put it into effect. Um, and actually, when I say everybody, it was that everyone was looking at the, the real players here, uh, Britain and England. Uh, that was what was, you know, if Britain and England said, okay, fine, we've got a deal, everyone else was going to say, okay, great. Um, because I think everyone realized that that was where this was really going to come into play. For the U.S., as I said, they were like, great, and it was all ready. It was just waiting for the president to sign off. Okay. Um, there's another question from uh, Neil Datsun. Who I will give permission to speak if you'd like. Um, yeah. But, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, yes sir. Can, yeah. Because unfortunately, mine, mine is very unstable. I keep on losing. <laughs> so I may have missed, missed something. Um, but I hope you can hear me. I, I, I get the impression from the talk, Alan, that the principle of the, shall we say, the British negotiating position from 1909 to 1914 was that it anticipated being a neutral um, in any conflict. But when it came up to the, um, the start line, the, you know, there was a, a kind of national backtracking think oh well hang on we're not neutrals after all um we've really just got to work to our own advantage uh, would you can you uh, comment on that if 
if um, you can hear me better than I can hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, make sure oh, I've got my volume turned up. So can you can you hear me, sir? Yeah, I just sometimes. sometimes okay. Unfortunately, All right. well, yeah. we'll blame it on the the ethers between uh, uh, England and, and the United States presently. Maybe it's COVID related. Um, anyway, you know, I can hear you, and I think that's a fair um, description or summary. Um, you know, certainly there was a great deal of discussion throughout, you know, even from, from post, well, pre-1907 Hague Conference, all the way through to the beginning of the war, there was a great deal of discussion and analysis over what should the, you know, laws of maritime warfare be and what positions England should take and what would be acceptable and not. And it, it's very clear to me that what you, what is happening is a growing recognition, a realization that the Britain cannot just take the most pro-belligerent stance because it will come back to haunt them uh, in the next conflict if, as they believe, they're just going to be a neutral. And I think it's true. I mean, they, uh, uh, you know, when push comes to shove and all of a sudden they're a belligerent, they're like, hang on, um, is this what we really want? Even though the analysis that had been done uh, previously was very much, hey, this is all right for us as a belligerent even. This is okay because, you know, they're getting, you know, it, it works both ways as a belligerent because under the rules of the belligerent, foodstuffs aren't subject to being seized. That's non-contraband. And the raw, various raw materials that England wants for their industry is not subject to being seized. And, and you know, I look at the the rayon uh scope of a blockade as basically it's whatever you can you know argue or show. It's pretty loosey goosey. I think it's much better than 800 nautical miles, which is a you know bright line. No one's going to spray paint a red line in the ocean. So you know it seems like Britain is, has come out ahead in the negotiation, and then when the war comes, it's like, hang on, do we really want to do this? And um, you know, I think it's interesting that Britain and Austria-Hungary have said, said, we'll adhere to this if you adhere to it. It's basically, you know, it's there for the, for the taking, for the offering. Uh, and instead it's like, yeah, just not so sure about this. And that's where things, you know, go haywire. Hope that answers your question, sir. Yeah, yes, more or less. I think so. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, if there are, are further questions, um, you, know, you, can, you can stick your hand up and, and we'll invite you to speak. And there are, there are a couple of them been typed, typed in. So Michael Keegan, for example, you've written a question. And if, if you would if you'd like to, to speak uh, and um, um, you, you may you may ask your question live if you prefer. OK, well, great. Can you hear me now? Yes, um, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Um, I guess my question was. Uh, Let's assume that this had been implemented, this declaration for the 1914-18 war. What difference would it have made? Would it be right to think, for example, that the blockade of Germany, which the Admiralty imposed on the outbreak of war, would have been even more difficult to make stick than it was uh, or were there nuances in the declaration which would have actually assisted Britain in its uh, uh, blockade of Germany during the during the conflict? Um, you know, obviously that's that's hypothetical. Um, I think it probably would have made it more difficult because you know, you know, the Royal Navy won the war with the blockade on food uh, to a great extent, and that was not subject to seizure under the 1909 London Declaration. But by the same token, you know, when you go from a limited war to total war, you know, in total war, you know, all bets are off. And I think ultimately, it's likely that ultimately Britain would have gotten to the same point in terms of, you know, what they were seizing and the scope of the blockade, uh, but it may have taken longer or been more difficult. Um, because it does work both ways. Once England starts to back away, then Germany really, is, it, Imperial Germany is free to, okay, fine, we're gonna start uh, you know, seizing uh, neutral vessels 
uh, bound for uh, England, uh, regardless of what they're uh, transporting. So, but no, I think that it would have made the, uh, the ultimate effectiveness, it would have probably delayed it. I think ultimately they would have gotten to the same point simply because it was total war. Um, but, you know, I think it would have gotten there. That's my own view anyway. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And there's a question uh, from Graham uh, Aldis. And, uh, it's been it's been written, but um, you might uh, wish to speak. Um, oh, once I find your name on the list, I will give you permission, Graham. Okay. Um, okay, go ahead if you if you'd like. Uh, hi, um, Alan. Thank you very much for well to both Alans, but. Um, <laughs> Alan, thank you very much for your talk, and I very much enjoyed reading your thesis as well. Uh, I qu query, though, whether it's appropriate to put the failure of the uh, Naval Prize Bill in 1911 in the House of Lords down to a grumpy bunch of Tories in the House of Lords voting it down. The Liberal government had a 120 majority on paper in the Commons, and they only ever managed 70. Uh, on the second reading and less than that on the third reading. So it was already struggling in the Commons. And what the House of Lords did was simply vote to put it off for three months. Uh, and so the Liberal government could have pushed on if they'd wanted to, but they didn't. Um, and they didn't because of the debate that had gone on principally about the setting up of an international prize court. And certainly there's an argument in the UK that it was the House of Lords that saved Britain when it came to war, because it had not allowed us to be bound by the Declaration of London and um, an international prize uh, court. Um, uh, and uh, that's often used now uh, as a reason for keeping with the House of Lords, which is our rather peculiar constitutional beast. Um, but one of the things- Right now I'll trade you. <laughs> I'll trade you. But one of the things is often said um, about the House of Lords is, is that it saved Britain from failure in the First World War. I'm, you know, I know that the context is that, but, you know, trying to look at it objectively, uh, which is what I, I'm trying to do. I mean, the, the criticisms that were being raised against the declaration i think are were un you know inaccurate and, and unfair i think that you know given the in my own view is is the the uh pronouncements or the you know here's the agreed principles i think they were just fine would have been just fine for england um i think that uh, part of it, what my own view is, I think the House of Lords was reasserting, uh, hey, you can't just ignore us, even though you've now taken away our ability to veto money bills. Um, you know, do I, you know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't agree that the House of Lords saved England uh, by not adopting the declaration in the First World War. Um, I think that if the declaration had been fully uh, ratified or adopted uh, and put into a or into force by all of the uh, 10 signatories, which generally then I think would have resulted in everyone recognizing uh, what it stated as generally accepted principles of international law. I think it would have been fine in part because the fact of the matter is once uh, the First World War becomes clearly total war, as we would now describe it, once it's total war, all bets are off. I mean, as a practical matter, uh, you know, the, you know, it's a misnomer to say international law, but, you know, the generally accepted principles of either maritime warfare or land warfare, uh, where they're really applicable and where they're really, you know, considered is in much more limited war or, you know, obviously the current big issues are, you know, conflicts involving non-state actors, you know, does it apply? Does it apply? How do you do it? I mean, and, you know, now there is a, you know, the drive to basically think that, well, we can sanitize war uh, and make it, you know, very surgical, uh, which I think is nonsense. It's my own view anyway. Um, but I don't think that it would have, I think that at the beginning, it, uh, you know, they said it might have uh, lengthened the war. Ultimately, I think because once it was clear that this was a, you know, war to the 
demise of somebody, some one of the belligerents, uh, once total war comes, they would have gotten there the same way. Okay. That's my view. Uh, right. Um, you want sea shanties. That's Alan James. That's word. the one. Yeah, that's where we're headed to next. So Christopher Serge, I think he liked your attempts at French so much that maybe the sea shanties uh, he wanted to, to, to hear. But there's also a serious question. Uh, so uh, Christopher Serge, I've just given you permission to, to speak if, you, if you'd like. Yes, uh, uh, no attempt at sea shanting on my part, I swear. Um, I had a question regarding um, the kind of future um, conferences that were taking place in the 1920s, uh, naval conferences. Were there any effects of the 1909 conference that made their way into future conferences? Um, the answer, I think, is not much because those conferences were so focused on disarmament and reducing the, the size of certain classes of vessels and the number that, that people could have. I will say this, that uh, a lot of the principles uh, relating to naval warfare, even from 1899, uh, are still out there. It's still in existence. Uh, the, U, the current manual of international law for naval officers in the United States uh, there are provisions that are word for word, virtually unchanged from 1903. Um, it's, you know, and I haven't looked at the current recently at the current manual for the Royal Navy, but I suspect that there are a lot of provisions that are quite similar to the manuals that the Royal Navy put out. And in particular, the one that they put out in 19, usually 1911, I think it was. Uh, which conform to the Declaration of London. So there is, you know, continuing, you will, vitality of the work that was done in between 1899 and 1909. Hope that answers your question. Yes, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Now, Neil Datsun, I, I think I never removed your permission to speak. So I think you're you're free to um, to, to 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 ask your question because I think you've got a, another one due. And and this is to everybody. You know, don't feel feel free to turn yeah. your microphone or your um, sorry your um, cameras as well if you like. But Neil, that's an, again. Or did you not have a second question? You're muted. Well, did I mute him? No. There you go. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, Alan, have you come back to me? Yes, I have. <laughs> I'm afraid this, this crashes out so much at the moment. Oh, I see. Oh, I beg your pardon. No. Um, there's no, it's, it's, it's not your fault. It's just circumstance. Um, yes, it, it was really more of a kind of observation um, is that I believe in 1960, and, and Alan, um, Alan, Speaker Alan, you, you used the expression, um, about uh, total war. And of course, in, in 1916, I'm pretty confident to say that Lord Lawburn, who was the next Lord Chancellor, argued that we shouldn't be blockading Germany at all because we weren't at war with the German people, but with the German government, mm -hmm. um, which is a kind of interesting thought about how men of that age thought about things. And the, shall we say, the revolution in thought there was, it, certainly in this country, on account of the First World War and that the First World War experience. I just wonder if you, if that um, seems relevant to you, and you, you, have you got any comment? Well, I, I do have this comment in that you know there are a lot of you know scholars out there who take the view uh, that you know. This was, you know, maritime law, naval laws of naval warfare are all, of, you know, who cares and that they weren't relevant to anything. And they, a lot of folks focus on the, you know, various statements of uh, Jackie Fisher, you know, about, you know, boiling prisoners in oil and that sort of thing. Uh, now I have my own, you know, I have, from based on the research, I think that a lot of that was after the fact statements that Fisher put into his you know, autobiographies and, and stuff or, or later on. Uh, and we could have a whole discussion about that and particularly, you know, what he did at the 1899 conference. Um, but, you know, 
these were, you know, you have to keep in mind in the, in the era, these are all gentlemen. And the word of a gentleman matters. And international law matters. And nobody, I don't think, in any country wanted to be seen as a scoff law of naval, of international law. Uh, you know, Germany didn't want that. I mean, you can't go through this whole process the way that all of these countries did uh, without believing that it matters. And I think that, that it, it really did uh, matter and that that's why it, there was such a discussion and why there what why Britain, you know, spent so much time in, with internal analysis and, and discussion and why everybody was, you know, taking their time to try to come up with, okay, this is, these are the rules of the game because they was a real thought that people would adhere to them because, you know, there was not a, um, you know, all of the previous law, uh, wars had been much more limited in scope. And, you know, international law was a big issue in the South African war, nearly led to conflict between the US and, and Britain. It was a big issue in the Russo-Japanese war. Uh, and those are the most recent experiences, really. And so they were taking this seriously. And yeah, I think that, I think the view was going in that, you know, they'd adhere to it. People would follow these generally. Yes, um, I, I have read somewhere that some, some of his contemporaries didn't think that Fisher was exactly a gentleman. Um, yeah. Fisher is an interesting character. There's no <laughs> doubt about that. No doubt about that. Yeah. He, he had, no. okay. but, but, you know, you want to see an, in, an interesting character or someone who really didn't think much of the laws of uh, international law, it's Alfred Thayer Mahat, uh, who very mm -hmm. nearly from my analysis, very nearly led to the um, first Hague conference falling apart single-handedly. I mean, it was because of <laughs> the efforts that, because of his efforts, the poison gas was not outlawed, hmm. uh, for example. Uh, so it wasn't because they passed the port the wrong way anyway. I'm sorry, what? <laughs> no, it wasn't because he, he passed the port the wrong way. Yeah. yeah. I want I wonder if I could ask a follow-on question there, not about the port, but about um, you know international law and, and, and the importance of it and, and, and one's word and so on. And actually, pin you down to the moment when the, when the 1909 agreement uh, collapsed, because you talk about the you know the British um, in 1914 saying you know that they'll they'll accept it, but with amendments, and obviously this was was un unacceptable. But I just wonder where uh, well, I wonder you know, uh, how significant those modifications were um, and whether Britain was effectively just tearing it up and knew that they were tearing it up or whether there was actually a, a, even even a, a, a tiny bit uh, of hope uh, on Britain's uh, side that uh, their modifications would, would, be, would be recognized. I suspect I know the answer. But... Well, I would say the latter, that they did, mm -hmm. they were hoping that these modifications would be recognized and that, you know, it would go along. And I think the fact that it sort of continued in some form for nearly two years, um, you know, indicates that. I mean, it really was, you know, if you look at the modifications that they were making, in one respect, it was quite a backtracking from what they had agreed to on blockade and conditional contraband and, and continuous voyage. But at the same time, it's, you know, it's kind of going back to what they, what Britain thought the rules were before the 1909 conference. Although interestingly, and I didn't discuss this, but in advance of the conference, they did a massive analysis of international law uh, to try to determine, you know, did what they think the law, what they thought the law was, was it really supported by, you know, customary international law. And the fact of the matter is, most of the most extreme positions that they had thought were well-established that they adhered to for a long time, there was basically no, it wasn't, they were standing alone. Uh, and they didn't go back to all of, to the extremes, but I think they, they were hoping that some of the stuff, because the things that they left in were favorable to them. You know, the things they left in were favorable. And, you know, obviously you've even got, you know, Germany to a great extent adhering to international law because they didn't go to, you know, unrestricted submarine warfare. They were on, off, on, you know, finally they said, okay, we got to do this. That's when things clearly have gotten, reached the level of total war because everyone's like, okay, this is a battle to the death and 
there's no ho there's no rules now. Right. Very good. Okay. Thank you. Christopher uh, has his hand up. Yes, he does. Yeah. So go go uh, ahead. Uh, um, I so we talked a lot about um, sort of diplomatic and political interests. Um, I had a question about the more capitalist and industrial side of it, thinking of like um, J.P. Morgan owning the international um, mercantile marine company and these, these huge international shipping companies. Did they have much of an influence or an impact or lobby at all um, in concern to this conference to get more favorable terms for their companies? Uh, the answer is that there that is yes. Um, certainly, well, certainly organizations, various maritime organizations in England would submit, you know, position papers to uh, the foreign office or to the home office or the colonial office about here's what they thought was favorable or not favorable. Um, there were, they would attack the parts of, there were submissions uh, post uh, 1909 declaration saying, you know, saying this is bad for us as traders, traders, T-R-A-D-E-R-S, um, you know, and for our maritime trade. So they, most of those positions though were just dismissed uh, from what I can tell internally. Um, you know, but they certainly made an effort to have, to exert some influence all the way along throughout this entire process. I mean, pre-1907 Hague Conference, um, you know, certainly pre-1909, post-1909, they're trying to put in their, they're trying to lobby, that's for sure. Okay, we might have uh, time for one more question. And if one doesn't come up, uh, I will ask you how sure you are that you identified Jackie Fisher in that picture from the 1907 um uh, I'll picture and, and 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 how long it took you to do that okay well let me see if i can i wonder if i can zoom let me just see this i'm going to see uh -huh. if i can share my screen these are the days of miracle and wonder i'm sure i'm sure you can see all right so let's see there you got my screen i think yeah you're on the final slide yeah okay okay now, can I zoom? How can I zoom? I don't think I can zoom, but I will tell you if, you know, at least on my screen, and I'm close, I'm, you know, looking at this. And I don't know, can you see my pointer? Yeah. Um, okay. Yes, we can. Okay. I so right there, if that's not Fisher's face, I don't know what is. Um, I mean, when I first got this photograph and was looking at it kind of zoomed in I'm just kind of going around it's like wait a minute I stopped there it's like that's Fisher um and you know I'm quite so I'm fairly certain of it now if you want I'm I'll happy to send you the picture and you can zoom in <laughs> yourself but I'm sure I'm just, I, mean, I can identify here in the middle that's of the American delegation that's Andrew White um uh, uh Seth Lowe um the guy from uh, the Netherlands, the USMS Netherlands, that's uh, Friedrich Halls there, those four guys right there. And I'm pretty sure this is Fisher in the back with other uh, technical delegates, because uh, I think the German uh, representative is two away from him. But I'm quite certain that's Fisher's face. It looks like him at the time. Um, and I searched around then, having seen him, to try to find uh, Mahan, and I can't find him in there, which makes sense given how he approached the conference. So I'm fairly confident, but I'll send it to you, Alan. And okay, you can well, no, it. I'm not, I won't be in a position to, 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 to argue with you, but wait, wait, I, I, just, you, I was impressed. Got, you've got to be on at least your third glass of wine by now, right? <laughs> so you know, he probably will pop out. <laughs> Very good. Well, on that note, I think it's time to uh, let you uh, back to your life, give you back your life. And thank you uh, for very interesting talk, very interesting um, set of questions. And so, um, you know, it's with it's with the, with, the, with, the, with the usual set of um, of, of thanks. Uh, and promises uh, for uh, hospitality and uh, wine when you're next uh, in uh, in London. And I'm sure that I speak for all 30 plus uh, of us uh, tonight 
uh, in saying that this was a very an interesting talk, very informative talk, uh, and we are very grateful. Thank you very much. Well, thank you all very much, and thank you, Alan. And I will uh, certainly seek to collect uh, next time I'm over on uh, the uh, wine. It's a deal. Or, it's a deal. Or other beverages. <laughs>